coordinator. Well done. Do you have the presenter? Yes. 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 Emeritus, over to you. I think we should start. It's two minutes past ten. Yeah, we can roll. I think we had a small agenda. That, uh, host, please, can you pray up? up uh, let's run through the agenda. How today will look like. And other announcement that is associated with virtual um, activities like this. Uh, sorry, what we uh, we have is just uh, this uh, presentation for now. So we have the profile. So once you click start, I can just display the profile for you to read. Then we'll move on. Okay. All right. Uh, Madam, open us up and I'll take it up from you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> morning once more. You're welcome to the Knowledge Sharing Series of the American Society of Indy. We want to thank our presenter this morning for taking out time to present and volunteer to share his knowledge with us. And as many that are also in the field that we going to be hearing feedback from today. We hope it's going to be a wonderful turning thing over. So, Doctor, we really appreciate you. On behalf of the executive, we say thank you. You're welcome to ASSP9 Nigerian chapter. Thank you, ma'am. Well done. So, coordinator, over, over to you, okay. coordinator. Okay. Um, good morning, all. Welcome to Series 2 of Knowledge Sharing from the 2020, uh, 2021 executive. Good morning. Please, before we start, I would, like, I would like anybody that is not talking to mute his or her microphone. Then for so those that having uh, unidentified um, screen names, please respectfully edit it. Uh, let us, each of us having iPad 3, iPad 2, 20 for easy um, coalition of attendance. Please just display your name that you as you would like it to be recorded in our attendance register. Please, um, Infinix Note 4 and so on and so forth. Please, let's just have a simple display name for knowing ourselves and for uh, taking the attendance. The host will be running through. Uh, we, uh, if we have reasons to speak, we have room to raise your hands. They'll be watching out and they'll give people audience accordingly. So that let us don't have um, uh, rowdiness in the house. Just like I said in, in the beginning, this is oil and gas month. We are trying to bring more personalized knowledge and expertise to people, not just in the oil and gas as, as a mining industry. This will give you an opportunity to ask questions and interact with like minds in the field. Please, can we have the uh, presenter's profile up if it is up in your end? Please, if you are not speaking, can you please can you mute everybody, host, mute everybody, and just open up my my. We have Doctor, we have Sad Doctor, Gogo Mary. Oh yes, oh yes, going to, going to present to us today. <laughs> Where are you? 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 Where are you?
I'm not doing that either. Yeah, I'm doing that either. What, what is it? Coordinator, you can read. Preferably. Please read this profile to us. We are not seeing the screen. Uh, Go Mary Oyet is a group head external relations and communications at, at OVH Energy. Doctor was a pioneer general manager EHSSQ at OVH Energy Marketing Limited and group head EHSSQ at Orlando, uh, Orlando PLC and Orlando Marketing Limited, respectively. He, he provides guidance to on all EHSSQ strategy and its execution. His current role involves developing and executing external business strategies, branch management, and communication activities. Dr. Oyed worked with Shell Petroleum Development Company, SPDC, and as a senior HSE advisor between 2000 and 2007. Dr. Oyet has NEBOSH certification. Oyet is, a is, a, is also a specialist fellow of the International Institute of Risk and Safety Management, SFIIRSM UK, and a fellow of the Nigerian Environmental Society, FNES, fellow of the Occupational Safety and Health uh, Association, UK Fellow of African Institute of Public Health and Professionals, Fellow of Chartered Institute of Human Capital Development, Fellow of Institute of Credit Administration, and a Fellow of Institute of Administrator and, Research and Researchers of Nigeria. He is a member of Institute of Safety Professionals of Nigeria, ESPON. He's gone white. Um, his schools, he has attended executive courses in Harvard of public health, HSC management, and leadership skills. Dr. Oyed was trained in Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, he had, um, we had Cambridge in advanced business re resilience, crisis management, business community. Well, he's fully loaded, he's alumni of Lagos. He's an alumni of Senior Executive Program at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government USA and London Business School United Kingdom. He's, he's well loaded and vested with a lot of experience that we can all tap into today if we are willing to reformat, to let go some of our, our beliefs and take what the subject matter expert will be sharing with us today. Doctor, please, can you go ahead with your presentation? Please, can we have doctor presentation up and let's start, let's roll. We'll be taking questions. Uh, uh, we have a short agenda after his presentation. If it's Uh, Doc, kindly unmute yourself, please. Okay, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Good morning, Doc. Yes, we can. Good yeah, morning, Doc. Doc. Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to thank the organizer, especially the... Logging in as this person. I want to log in as... Lady President um, Messi. Um, for also showing mercy on me, to asking me to come here to speak to uh, experts in safety. 
and it's a big privilege, a rare one in particular. And uh, how I was picked out from where I was hiding is something that uh, is very unique. So I want to thank the Executive Council uh, for this opportunity and uh, it's a knowledge sharing. I also come here to learn from the expert in the house. And uh, I think it's going to be something that all of us will enjoy this opportunity. Uh, my topic is promoting sustainable HAC culture in times of crisis in oil and gas. And uh, the presenter has already defined and showed my profile. And in summary, this is what you have. It's not something to talk much about it. Um, I am an indigenous trained HSC practitioner, uh, one of the local content, as you, one of the local content breed from Shell. Uh, Shell is an international company that has trained some of us locally, and we've been able to move to impact that knowledge within our sphere of influence. And uh, that this is who I am and uh, what I have gone through in building my profile and career pathway. Outline will include, uh, we'll look a little bit of introduction, case studies, um, what is, now I want to quickly uh, inform the house that in trying to format HAC in the local content, when I joined Wando, we decided to change the word to environment health safety so that when I use EHS, do not get worried the same terminology as HSC. It's just that with me, my own environment, that is what we're using. So I'll be looking at the impact of culture on HSC performance, uh, look at HSC culture model, look at some evidences of strong HSC culture. We look at some tools for HSC culture level, then how do you promote and sustain EH culture? look at corporate culture leadership, which is very important in this discussion. Um, we look at the biggest room for improvement in the world, and that is the room of continuous improvement. Then finally, we conclude and uh, share some lessons. Then we take some questions from our people and do interaction. Um, this is part of my training uh, course. I want the house those who have been with me now, especially, I have to be specific here. Some people from OBH Energy will have been here, so I want you to remain mute here. Some students from the, my master's and PhD class from University of Port Tycor will also be here. If you are here, because I know that some of the things you may be familiar with, especially with my brain teaser. So I want the people who are not familiar with my teaching process to try and uh, keep the brain warm this morning so that as we progress, we will interact properly. So I want to start with a brain teaser and that is what you are seeing in the next slide. Um, this is Anthony and Cleopatra. These couple have been found lying dead. Um, found lying dead on the floor of Egyptian villa. Nearby is the broken ball. As at the time they were dead, no, when, there are no marks on their bodies when they were found dead, and they were not poisoned. Also, when this couple died, nobody was in Villa to be able to explain what happened to them. My brothers and sisters in safety, professional, can somebody quickly tell us um, the organizer, if the person was there is a mark for raising up your hand, when you raise up your hand, the person can allow you to speak to us. Tell us what you think happened to this couple in the Egyptian villa. How did they die? I put a caveat. Uh, those, my students, report. Um, those who have trained in the past who are very familiar with this, allow the new people to think like the way you thought the day you had upon it to see this. So let's think about this. Please raise your hand for recognition. Okay, can we ask Jack? Jack, can you talk to us? 
All right, good morning, all. This Jack here. Uh, for me, uh, Antonia and Cleopatra, no, no marks, and if they are, they are in poison, now the first possible thought is if they are ill internally, that means if they probably must have argued and argued and they had a maybe heart attack, because there's a way you can argue and raise up your BP level. Maybe both of them have argued severely and have gotten to a point where they both had heart attack and uh, had a serious, you know, problem with their hearts and they died. Or they, where they were in the room doing whatever they are doing, there might be a gas leak into that compartment, which will just quietly and silently, silently kill them. And they fell on the floor. Of course, like the caveat said that there's no mark, there is nothing broken. So it could be that they had a heart attack or a poisonous gas was, I mean, uh, seeped through to their room and they inhaled and died. So that's my take on this. Thank you. Okay, Jack, well done. Thanks for your explanation. Uh, that is why we're HSC practitioners. Our job is to appreciate risks, identify what could go wrong, provide solution. Any other person? I just want to take only three comments, then we'll progress. Yes, we have uh, Ademola. Can you go ahead, please? Good morning, everybody. Um, there is a broken bowl nearby, so probably um, something was inside the broken bowl that slipped out or that spilled out, and well, Antonia and Cleopatra fell. You don't have to be any um, marks. They can eat their head on the floor and from there, um, die. Um, head trauma, something. Okay, Ademola, thank you for your contribution. Thought process, yeah. well, listening. I just want to warm everybody up so that you leave your comfort zone to know that you are in an AKC environment. Thank you. The last person to talk to us before I take uh, over. Da Daniel Ohio Mohare. So go ahead. Daniel, I'm afraid of Daniel because Daniel is a dreamer. He will have gotten inspiration from God. Okay, Daniel, talk to us whether you have gotten <laughs> one of these revelations. Daniel, talk to us. Okay, if Daniel is not coming up, I don't know. Ebele, Teresa, do you want to say something? No, sorry. I, sorry, I'm muted. I'm, I'm listening. Sorry. Okay. So, Doc, you can go ahead. Okay, Daniel is not talking to us. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, like Jack had explained, it's either the death of association. Um, the essence of this discussion, again, I'll explain to you, is that Anthony and Cleopatra are fiction. These are two lovely fish in a boil that was placed on the table and while they were dancing in that ball, in that water, um, the ball fell suddenly and the two fish found themselves on the floor. Why on the floor, like Jack said, the two fishes were starved of oxygen. While they were in the ball, they were as strong like any other person. They had capacity to have control over the environment. They have capacity to make life for themselves and provide the aesthetics, the honor of the villa desire of them. But when the bowel got broken and they fell on the floor, they could not make use of the external oxygen within the floor environment. So they die of association. That is why you did not see any mark on them. And as I said, there are pictures, they are not real human beings. From this discourse, you can see that as HSC pra practitioner, one of the burden we carry is our ability to carry out risk assessment, either with what we are very familiar with or what we are not familiar with. 
it is expected that we should always think within the box and in some situations outside the box to be able to provide solutions to some incidents that may have happened within our operating environment. And therefore, COVID-19, the crisis we find ourselves in, has put on us a burden to be able, as HSC practitioners, to have to live a dual life, a life in the office and a life now at home. When you look at this, I wanted to, I said, so let me share with you from a downstream background. Let me share with you from a downstream background. When you look at the little map I provided, with the onset at the beginning of the year, life was easy for everybody in the industry. Everybody had their budget in place by the end of 2019. And by January, most organizations have started putting their strategies to be able to run their strategies and started implementation. Most of us did not know that by March, because as of December we had about COVID-19, a lot of top process was, it is a China uh, issue. Unfortunately, the world of safety is a common world. We got it transported and started seeing evidence. So with evidence coming in in March, people being shut down from April, May, and little ease off in June, you see that most organizations decided to sit behind like the federal government of Nigeria and look at their budget, and in most situations discover that they are not going to be productive and they started downsizing. So a lot of our brothers and sisters in the oil and gas industry lost their job. Some, with the magnanimity of the various management of various organizations, decided to cut their salary half. Some have been compulsorily asked to step back until when things improve, especially our friends in the aviation industry. So for us in, in the oil and gas, those companies that do not have the capacity to be able to navigate this trying moment, this trying environment, this energy tide, a lot of people lost their livelihood. And that hysterically impacted on the livelihood of their family members and their beloved ones. That is one fundamental thing that the crisis moment we are has brought to fall. Again, because a lot of people have downsized and they have lean human resources to man their operation, we have also noticed a surge of incidents in most of these organizations. And in some, when studies, are, when investigations are being carried out, it pointed to management failures in area of human capacity, that the facilities were not appropriate and adequately manned. So when you look at all this, what, as, what is clear is the culture of the organization, in terms of to mention to you, that when they were looking at downsizing, when they are cutting down on their even production, HSC is the one that stands in conflict between operation and production. However, as a conscience of the business, as the conscience of the business, it is imperative for us, to, for us to understand that whatever decisions we are making, whatever decisions we are taking as an organization, that the overall impact will be on assets, on people, on the environment, and above all, we impact on the reputation of the organization. We I decided to look at 
the international uh, seen some case study. If you check at what happened in April 12, 1912, when Titanic was on his first voyage, after the ship was built, and we were told that, look, the captain said, the builder said, look, even, not even God, I can sink this ship. Yes, that is what we were told. And for those of us in the SPDC, you know that Titanic has become the model we use in our case management system. However, at that maiden voyage, we were told 1,514 deaths were recorded, and the company never recovered from that incident. I'm happy that some of my colleagues in the industry recently, I think that last week, decided to remember the 32 years incident that happened that turned around, that changed the face and the face of HST in the oil and gas. What are we talking about? That is the Papa Alpha incident. And for the review of that incident, we realized that the 167 people that died had breadwinners. Yes, the company incurred over 3 billion naira in trying to remedy the cleanup and every litigation that come with it. But what is important here is that 167 people died. These are operational failures. We will see what HAC has to do for us to discuss about. Now, when you come in into most recently, in April 20, 2010, we talked about the Makondo well, the deep well horizon. That incident cost the company about 65 billion naira for cleanup and associated costs as of 2018. Um, but what is important here is that I had the privilege of meeting with the general manager of operation as part of our case studies in London Business School. And the young man said, look, we are not talking about the 65 billion loss of money we spent. We lost 70% of the entire workforce. The company had to reorganize, had to restructure, and 70% of the old BP workforce were laid off. So what you have today in BP is only historical of 30% of the original workforce and 70% of the new workforce. That is where we are going. That is what I want you to address to so understand the importance of HAC culture in every organization. Um, the story of the incident that happened at Ed Force Shield, um, the Bonfield incident. Yes, luckily nobody died, but we know that it was a massive incident to manage in terms of um, the loss in terms of oppression to, the, uh, uh, to everybody. Now, I quickly want to look at HAC, the values of HAC and finances. And I picked only a company to look at this point, and that is the BP incident. As of 2009, BP declared a profit of 16.8 billion US dollar profit for the year. Not less than, not up to a year, the company lost. 11 lives in that Makondo incident. There was OSP for 87 days, totaling 4.9 million barrels of crude into the environment. These are the concerns about what had happened to the natural environment, what had happened to the ecosystem. And in that sense, 2010, the company declared a loss. 3.3 billion US dollar. It is a massive loss to the shareholders and to the environment. And what is fundamental here again, like I said earlier, in the loss and the cost cumulatively as of 2018, it's about 65 billion US dollars. Um, I decided to go international now. I want to come local. And in doing that, I have to put this uh, caveat 
that please those whatever you are going to see if you are the type that does not have capacity to take shock um you can decide to wait a little after that this is about the jegun and a abule a dual pestas pipeline explosion that happened most recently want you to look at some of the pictures of incidents that happened um you can see on my extreme upper left hand we are looking at the NNPC explosion. So this Onisha, uh, sorry, we are looking at the Onisha petrol tanker that claim over 117 lives. Worrisome, two pregnant women were involved. Now, when you come down, you see the explosion of NMPC, Betyokun OML 40 platform in Wari Delta State. This happened in July this year. We lost seven employees. Again, what is key here is the life that was lost. And these numbers are worrisome. If you come into the middle, June last year, I think last year, we had about the Otto de la Brick incident, which was very worrisome. Almost 50 something number of cars and over 11 people were also affected. In 2017, this is some, the one. I investigated it. The NMPC Papa JT fire outbreak. Four people lost their lives because of sharp. Yes, assets were lost, but human beings, breadwinners of family. The incident that happened in 2017, September, in the Papa Jetty. When you go that early morning, you saw cars belonging to victims. They drove into the facility with their own cars, and there were no more alive. So when you look at this, like Galileo, the 15th century Italian mathematician, I am only going to help you to find it out yourself. So in course of going into HSC culture, there's no much things I'm going to tell you outside what I have shown to you to be able to appreciate that when HSCs are violated, we human elements suffered, the organization suffered, the reputation of the organization is at stake. And therefore, the International Labor Organization has put incidents of death to 2.5 million people per year and 374 million injuries per year when HSC cultures are, are not adhered to. And I'm sure it is not our intention to be part of these statistics. What is the one thing that is common to all these incidents is poor HSC culture. And that is why I just quickly mentioned to you that International Labor Organization is worried about it and shall we tell that 2.5 million dead arising from poor HSC and 374 million injuries per year arising from HSC when HSC culture are not respected. So I want to quickly take you through some of the things that lead us to where we are today. Um, to this uh, academia to describe the way that safety is like, prevent accidents, give a good pro this graph. You see that prior to 1989, 
people deploy a lot of standards, a lot of technology to manage their, their engineering improvements. If you remember your risk reduction strategy, engineering design to be able to mitigate your elimination suspicion. However, with all this equipment and hardware that has come to support the HNC management system, one thing, and also within the period, there are a lot of emphasis on safety. There are a lot of emphasis on compliance. So at a point, most organizations are into HSC because they want to obtain DPRO licenses. They, they don't want to be shut down. They want to be seen as a company that is complying to HSC rules and standards. And HSC was not part of their DNA. Again, as progress, I remember in 2000, in share we started uh, ensuring that all our assets all our districts, all our facilities, flow stations, upgrade are satisfied to ISO 14001. So there was an improvement in the HSE management system to about that 2000. So now you are seeing HSE be integrated, reporting because of uh, being vital. And uh, as the shared group, we are looking at certifications and assurance to give comfort to shareholders that we're actually doing what we ought to do. There are a lot of training, enhancing capacities, and risk management system, especially as an effect management process, become deployed across all strata. People were being trained in contract management. However, that also has not actually contributed wholly and solely to the reduction of fatalities and incidences in the workplace. The turnaround was the House and Mine project that was deployed in the early 2001, 2002, 2003. When House and Mine came on board, we are not talking of behavioral safety, the human element, the way the person thinks, the way his brains work with him. So we are saying, come to work with your head intact, with your hands together, with your legs and hands, and also go back home safely. With behavioral safety, we can now see the importance of our family as being part of our safety slogan. We do this because we have the loved one we are taking care of. We can also see visible leadership that demonstrates commitment, that are involved, that takes ownership. These leadership are seen to walk the talk under the same as and mind, the improved HSE culture. We see personal accountability people taking responsibility for their actions and inactions, people offering explanations to why they are not able to deliver on assigned tax and responsibilities, and people ready to accept responsibilities for whatever ineptitudes or whatever gaps that are happening. We see HSC culture bringing in attitude. And here we are saying, look, excellence is not an act, but it's a habit. Once you form it over time, it becomes an attitude. An attitude influences your character, and your character influences your behavior, and your behavior with your attitude together determines your altitude, and that gives you a control over the work environment where you are. We also saw from HSC improved culture where there are shared purpose and belief systems. Organizations now have a vision and a mission. For instance, where I primarily work, my vision is to be marketers of choice, providing trusted petroleum products and services to customers in Nigeria. That is my own uh, vision. I wanted to provide trusted petroleum products and services to customers in Nigeria. I have to underline the word customer because there is a sharp purpose. There is somewhere I'm going to. So what is my mission? How did I get here? How will I be able to deliver that? HSC culture helped me. And I said in my mission statement, are we building a customer-centric organization by operating to the highest safety standards and delivering outstanding values to shareholders? So you can see that in my vision to meet my customers' obligations, in my, no, in my vision to meet my customers' obligations, I've also put in my mission that I have to do this safely. So we also look at my belief system in terms of what I call what, what, what we Christian is at Cosi, you are seeing me talking about customer. I demonstrated ownership, looking at that, uh, we need to achieve this together as team. Then 
I'm telling you that I must do this with all utmost integrity and safety is uppermost in what I do. So HSE deliver business value. Like I said in part of my introduction that HSE remain often most of its time in conflict with operations and production. But I want everybody here to go home with the fact that HSC is the conscience of the business. No business will operate and deliver outstanding value to shareholders without HSC being communicated persuasively and acting decisively when there is need for consequence management. And that this slide forms the basis and background from, from what, most of what I'm going to be discussing. Now, because I'm talking about HSE culture in prime moment, I want to quickly take you back to some models. So I have here the binary model by raising 1998. Again, in looking at improved HSE culture, we are talking of mindfulness. Here we are chronically uneasy about what, we, what could go wrong for ourselves and also for our coworkers. When an organization is thinking of what could go wrong among their members, among each workforce, then they will keep that in mind. Our leaders are competent and they're involved and they know what goes wrong. That, that communication, like I said, you communicate more persuasively and assertively and you also ensure that actions are taken more decisively. We also ensure that we knowing the risks and the problems and how to solve them. As HSE practitioners, risk substitution is key. HSE is no longer the business of one unit. It's no longer the business of a section called HSE department. I run an organization today where HSE is in the line and every member of my organization have HSE tasks and targets as part of their 2020 objectives. And at the end with the scorecard system we run, you will also be appraised based on your HSC performance. And therefore, HSC is no longer the obligations and responsibility of one unit. HSC in this time of crisis, in this moment of pandemic, is the responsibility of everybody. Remember I said HSC is no longer only in the workplace. Now, 60% or almost 70% of the HSC is even at home. But most of us are working for... maybe 20, 30, 40% in the office. We always speak up when we face some problem. In my organization, we decided to modify the life saving rule, which was uh, 12 life saving rule. We came up to almost 16. And the first one we decided to put, we extracted it from the golden rule of shares. We say intervene in non-compliant situations. When we can speak out, when we can intervene without waiting for things to go wrong, then we'll have saved a lot of us the, 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 the boarding, when you look at the highest best principle of HS management system of the direct and indirect costs, you see that the direct causes are just few things, insurance costs you see, but indirect costs are enormous. Investigation time, ability to bring in more people on board, time, uh, lost production time is something that we need to avoid. That could have happened when somebody rightly intervened at an incipient stage when an unsafe act and unsafe condition has been observed. We also look at, is this flexible? What are we learning out of this? So we are competent. Do we have a competent workforce? Do we trust ourselves? Are we empowered to stick and fix? Do we share Latin uh, failure, uh, lat uh, lat uh, lateral learning? When we see Latin failure, do we fix them? You will need to empower our workforce. We need to ensure that the workforce that we have asked, we have asked to go to war, we equip them with all the necessary ammunition in the Amora. We get to hear bad news straight away and we make the necessary changes rapidly and effectively. You will see it in the next, uh, the next slide when we'll be talking about the various uh, pathological stage of HSE. We have people sit when something goes wrong, that is when management will wake up, investigate, and those who are found culpable, punish them, send them out of the company. Is that the HSE culture we are preaching today? In this time of crisis and pandemic, is that the type of HSE culture? Reason and deal with me that the HSE culture that I work for you now is HSE culture where there is a shared value, where there is a shared responsibility among colleagues, among the workforce. And above all, when we have done so well, 
Can we get recognized and rewarded when we are doing good things? And when we know we have been treated fairly if things go wrong. Now, I quickly share with you the thought of what happens to Jack Walsh. He's left today. One time CEO of General Electric. He said in his three years in the, the book, of, and mentally he knew because of that incident, he would be sad. What Jack Walsh did was to write the report after the investigation was done and was taking it to the HSC director. And he says, expectation was that as he dropped the report, maybe they would give him a sack letter to go home because he has already communicated that to his family member. Jack Walsh was shocked when he was told, with all the lesson learned, with all that you have said happened to this incident, please use this lesson and build us a formidable organization. And today, like my boss will always say, I'm not averse for people making mistakes. I am worried when that mistake is repeated. And I'm glad to mention to you from those of you who are management students who have read about the life of Jack Walsh in his days in General Electric, he went back and built the empire, one of the blue chip organizations in the world today. That is the lesson we are talking about in HSC practices. Are we fairly treated? Do we correct ourselves with love? Do we hear out why do we take decisions and what has happened has happened? Colleagues in this training, let us treat, let us hear our colleagues out. Let us treat people fairly and the lesson learned will not be lost. The next model I want us to look at is the, the evolutionary model by Westrom, 1988. In this model, we're talking about pathological, power-oriented. Here, we don't want the boss to hear anything. Information is sitting. It's only the top that knows about it. Responsibilities are not diverged. People, um, if there are issues, failures is covered up because nobody wants to be scapegoat. We notice in this pathologi uh, pathological setting, due to HSA evolution model, that there are low corporations and there was no trust at all. What about the bureaucratic rules oriented? People don't follow information except it comes from the top. You must follow a defined set of systems. Responsibilities are compartmentalized. Failures is followed up with justice. Whoever that violated this process must be met with appropriate consequence management. And that is what we saw. And a lot of people struggle with that level. What about the more corporations and trust? Here again, people are building trust and see what they can do. The generative performance driven information is actively sought. Responsibility are shared, which is better. And that is what you're going to see that most organizations are going to the generative performance driven in the next model we'll share with you. Failure causes are inquiry are carried out and improvement are also preferred. Innovations are required. People are asked to think within and outside the box. High cooperation and trust. This is very key. You work as a team, you, work, you, you protect your colleague back and they protect your back. No cover up. You share risk appreciation together. You cooperate and trust each other and you move. And that is very vital in this uh, HSC culture we are talking about. Here is the evolution model again, the Austin 1991 model. This is the model that most organizations today, including where I work, OVH Energy, and where I came from, Shell, are adopting. Pathological, who cares as long as we are not caught? These are the old in this HSC culture where people just, all they need to do is, if nothing happens, no reporting of incidents, they don't share in lateral learning because the regulators are not there, so they are not caught. But as you progress the ladder, increasing inform, uh, if, uh, as you are increasingly informed, safety is important. We do a lot every time we have an accident. People run around, set up incident investigation, um, it's done, people are punished, and we move on. However, at the calculated level, we have system in place to manage all hazards. And we put effort together, get everybody communicating the organization, identify all what could go wrong, put all the process in place, and we progress. 
we move to the proactive step, we are safety leadership and values driven continuous improvement. Here you see leadership at the top being the one defining and driving HS implementation. Leadership takes ownership and ensure that HS is cascaded across the organization and everybody within the organization takes role, takes turn to believe in HSC as being preached and communicated by leadership. Above all, the generative model. Here, HS is how we do business here. This is what you call house and mind. Here, people without you asking are conscious of their environment. Without asking, you know, you remember when in the early years of 20, in early 2000, when the seat belt started in Shell, initially there was violation, but at a point, people build that culture that was the entire car, you want to start, it just it becomes a default that you have to put it on, strap your CBA before you move on. That is on auto mode. That is what we want HSC to be. I don't know which organization in this country today will be pride of generative, but I know that people are between calculative and proactive. They are moving. They are trying to continue because of the environment we find ourselves and continue to preach as a mind, continue to get people in that mood. And when you successfully adopt this strategy and follow this trend, you'll be increasing trust and accountability. And above all, the return on investment will be high for the investors to share dividends from. And they, you too, as an employee of the organization, will be happy because you are working in an organization where at the end of the year, people that come to work go back home safely to meet their beloved family. And that's what is important. You stay safe, your colleagues are safe, the organization is safe, the society is safe, and become a better place for us. Socrates says, if each man, if each or adopt the society will become a better place. So when all of us have imbibed this HSE culture and are doing all that is required of us, then we are trying to uh, uh, inculcate a better HSE culture. The evidence of strong HSE cultures include a um, few areas such as expectations are clear. There is a black line between what is acceptable and unacceptable behavior. That is what the culture will teach us. Every member of organization we understand what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Openness, people report accidents. People, we are aware that most organizations, people don't report accidents because of vindictiveness, because people will be punished. People don't report accidents because they are afraid of the scorecard. They want the scorecard to be clean. They want people to see them. They want staff to see them as people who are not making mistakes. People don't report near misses. And they are forgotten to know that when unsafe and unsafe conditions build up, they move into a situation where you re result in nyamisis. And when nyamisis are not reported and investigated, it will lead to lost time injury. And when lost time injuries are not reported, it can take us to fatality. So because of fear, people don't report. So are we open? And that is organizations that people report and they know that they're not going to be victimized. And even when, after the reporting, do we have a culture, a system in place that tracks this reporting and ensure that it is closed so that people are encouraged to say the last one I identified, the last incident I reported, it was investigated, it was closed out. And that is the uh, picture of a strong HSE culture. There is an atmosphere of trust. People feel comfortable to reasonably challenge the status quo. You can't come here and say, because I've been working here for the last 25 years, and a young graduate, you have just gone to have some and come back and tell you, oh, God, this is how this thing should be done. He said, no, you know whom I am. I have been doing this job uh, 25 years ago, even when you are not born. Please, for the current HSE culture we are talking about, is an atmosphere of trust. So we have people are free and comfortable to reasonable report incidents and change the status quo. We cannot depend, if you think like uh, uh, Peter Docker who said, if you adopt the STEM management principle, that has worked for you 30 years ago and things to work today, you are just deceiving yourself. It's like a madman standing at one spot and jogging without making a change in motion. People are held accountable for results, but not blamed. We must be accountable for our action and action. And when there are defaults, we also be responsible to accept those blames and we'll move on and learn lessons from it and never, like I gave the example of Jack Watch, to make those mistakes again. Let us use those mistakes as lessons learned. People are proactive in the management of freaks. Let us not wait until those freaks crystallize before 
let us try to put culture around rewarding people who are good in leading indicators, people who on their own report incidents, people who on their own are doing emergency drills when they are required to do it, people on their own who are doing review of policies. We need to reward those, those practice steps, those leading indicators will help us. Let us not wait for lagging indicators. These are evidence of strong HSE culture. Continue, people learn from mistakes and success of others within and outside. Let us learn from our mistakes. Organizations should share lessons learned from incidents. And once that is done, you will be marveled that mistakes will not be repeated again. But it's painful. Investigation should be carried out thoroughly and in a timely manner, and lessons learned applied. You do not allow evidences around incident sites to be lost. Put a structure in place, put a well-defined accident reporting and investigation procedure that enable you within the law. Yes, DPR is still within six hours, we should report to them within 24 hours to the nearest uh, DPR office. Let us build our own HSC reporting structure and follow it. Non-conformities are flagged and remedial action driven to timely closure. When you look at um, part of uh, the, the current uh, OSHA's uh, uh, the current uh, uh, ushers, uh, ISO 40, 45001, you, you realize that part of the requirement that is very important to us is incident and non conflict reporting, and that you have it under the clause of section 10 on improvement. Incident reporting, uh, you have ability to look at non conformity and corrective actions that are suitable, that are effective, that are adequate. These are the improvements that has brought in in ISO 45001 that are very important in HSC culture for organizations to adopt. Um, there is visible management commitment actions back up world. Walk the talk. When you have leadership demonstrating a strong HSC culture and leave it, dear colleagues, you have no choice than to also align. But when you have an organization where the management is saying one thing and is doing different things, sometimes, like I said earlier, when HSC come in conflict with operation and you allow your management to take a decision and it's leaning towards operation because you wanted to make quick money, then something is wrong. But if you have a management system that says, look, HSC team, can we sit together? How can we navigate this water and ensure that this is done safely? The HSC people know that, look, this can be done. They will come back in there, there are waivers. And before a waiver is given, a risk assessment is done. And we bring that risk in terms of the control we prefer to, a, to as low as reasonable practicable, to a point where everybody said, yes, we can go on with this operation. But when you have a management system that once there is operation and there's HSC, HSC is an orphan, operation is the king, then something is wrong. So we need management system that talk with their mouth, live with their mouth, and walk the talk. There are sharp perceptions about safety. Like I said at the beginning, shared values is very important. Let us know that HSC is not only for the business, it's also for us. If I'm alive today, my family is alive, then we can ask for better remuneration, we can ask for better packages, we can even change jobs and become more useful to our family. These are some of the practices we see in, uh, we can see some HSC structure here. Okay, let me just take back. I started to share this uh, with you. You can just appreciate a few HS incidents that happened. Look at on the lower part, a man carrying a wheelbarrow with load, going to, uh, and look at the walkway, you'll be shocked. See the truck accident, see the fire incident, then the man climbing at height. These are cultures. Then look at the incident that happened for this uh, site, how this building got collapsed and people died is something that we need to get worried about. These are some HSE practices. It's happened in our workplace, it's happened at home. We have had a situation of a lot of building collapse, either due to poor risk assessment, poor quality of work done, and you can see a lot of such things happening. Climbing at height, fire people now, there is a fire on the building, 
and we are now using ladder that has not been supported. Two people on the ladder up, not following process, not following procedures, and they are even dead before extinguishing the fire. You can see the load we carry in our manufacturing industry, the impact it has on us. Our road today, if you are driving on a Nigeria road, you must have that driving capacity to believe that you are driving five cars. You are in your own car, that is the one you are driving. So on the left hand, you are driving another car. On your left hand, you are driving another car. In your front, you are driving another car. Behind, you are driving another car. Plus your car is five cars you drive. And that is what you call defensive driving. So you can see that on our road, go to work, come back to the house, we must observe a strong AKC culture. I decided to put this to just give you an highlight of HSC2 style for HSC culture level. Um, reporting and, and recording HSC information, incidents and near misses, uh, mandatory reporting, anonymous reporting, confidential reporting, open non-confidential reporting. If you are at the pathological stage, and like I said, let us adopt the pathological, reactive, calculative, proactive, and generative stage. So when you follow this model, track this in your various organization, you will see where you are. Incident investigation analysis, Continue to track the investigation mandatory root cause analysis is done. And like I said, in section 10 of ISO 45001, the new uh, uh, ISO model that, that replaces OSHA 18001 that was released in March uh, 2018, the import here is for us to investigate, identify uh, non-conformity, and ensure that corrective actions are done. And when we correct them, then we go to the next level where we audit. Um, we depend on internal auditors and third party auditing um, for most organizations that has uh, external sponsors financial from outside. My organization, we subject our process to international financial cooperation performance standards. We are also following the CDC model of environmental social governance. So these are some of the third party audit that, that audited, that normally audit our process and tell us what to do and we are following it. So benchmarking, management system audit is done. And once those is done, it will also help you. The management side here, MFI is very important. Let management uh, adopt what we call MBA. It's a common degree, we you know, for a lot of professionals. But in the workplace, you can adopt MBA, management by working around. So you don't need to have the MBA from London Business School or Lagos Business School. You can adopt in your workplace, management by working around MBA, and that will help you in your audit profile. So we continue again. When you look at HSC risk management, we carry a process risk management. Process risk is, uh, is, is a topic, uh, uh, an area of its own. Um, my good friend, uh, Emmanuel Okudo, is very strong on this. My good friend and colleague, we are together before we uh, find our separate ways. Process safety is very important in industry. Most of the incidents that happen in our industry today are process failure. So we need to build a structure around process safety. And once our workforce are trained, from incident investigation, incident uh, pro, uh, accident investigation, we build a uh, strong uh, process uh, audit review. We ensure that the process uh, system is properly audited, management of chains are deployed, asset integrity is maintained. We ensure that whatever equipment we're using goes to what we call RAM, not risk assessment max in this case. It is called reliability, uh, uh, maintainability, and uh, availability. Once that is done, I think uh, you'll be fine. Then HSC training. Training is very key. Training is very key. You see that strongly being defined. Training is very key. It comes strongly under section seven of ISO 45001 support. You need resources, you need people to be trained, you need competence, you need people to be aware, you need information to be shared. You need people to develop themselves. Here, I'll make a caveat. What we are doing today is a training for the entire uh, ASEP uh, group. But what is also key, you as a person should also define your own roadmap, de define your own individual development plan, and flow it. Do not wait for your organization to train you. Some of you will say, ah, doctor has a robust uh, profile. I must confess to you that most of them are from my salary. I have to build myself to what I wanted to be. And I've not stopped learning. And given every opportunity, I've continued to learn with all the support I've gotten from my supervisors and my bosses in where I work. 
and therefore train is very key. You also need to train your executive so that what you know, I must confess to you that most recently we have to get the entire almost 350 people in my organization through ISO 45001. But we want them to understand, including the management, the ESCO, we want them to understand why HS is important for our business. Observation by supervision is very important. By peers, colleagues, we need you even while at home. On safe and safe conditions happen in your workplace, please continue to report them and ensure that lateral learnings are shared. So observation is very important. So if you follow this model I've just given to you, I think we will be able to make a good HSC structure for organization. Above all, we also need to motivate our team. I talk about lagging and leading indicators. For me, more of leading indicators behavior. Let us recognize our workforce. But even when some strong lagging indication interventions are done, we can also reward people. So this is also important. Then when we have a behavioral change, people discuss these issues in and out of season through two box talk, HSC meeting, HSC alert. Then remember, communication is very key in the HSC management system. I share a simple experience with you. During the COVID period, I have a boss that every Wednesday come up with a newsletter communicating what he's doing about uh, COVID-19 and the business. And on Friday, they come up with what we call the CEO uh, message. Also telling people what the health of the business, also giving you an account of what has happened, the security intervention, the HS intervention, the welfare activity taking, what he is doing with his management team and every members of the essential workforce to ensure that people are alive. So that when even you are at home, you are not worried, you know that the business is working. He does that every week. There is no over communication in HSC management system in this time of pandemic. So I encourage every leader, every member that has opportunity to continue to communicate persuasively to your workforce, assertively to your workforce, and ensure that action that needed to be taken decisively, you are done with it. So when you have a strong communications among your workforce, people don't hide any, they, can't, they have nowhere to hide to say they, they are not aware. Again, when communications are made adequate to every employee, Remember, that is also a duty of care because you have communicated the risks and whatever everybody is doing to the entire workforce. So nobody will hide under any litigation to say he has not been properly informed, he has not been properly trained, he is not aware of what could go wrong. So these are also very important strategies we adopt as leaders in the industry. Communication is very key. So if you follow this model, I think we will do better. I'll be rounding up by looking at leadership. HSC, we cannot discuss HSC without leadership, without a corporate culture, without continuous improvement. So corporate culture is very important. How does this organization behave? I mentioned to you that where I work, our mission statement is building a concentric, uh, building a customer concentric organization by operating to the high safety standard. The high safety standard has become part of our core value and that is a corporate culture so everybody, anything you are doing, you know that, do, is, it, is it compliant with what you call cost fee? And the SDI is safety. Is it safe for us to do it? So leadership is very important here. And I decided to share with you this cost model. So know that I've talked about the mission, the vision, the policy strategy, and organizations are share value that is very important. Remember the invisible elements of corporate cultures include all written rules, the the status, relationship, you manage, your attitude and feelings to work, people's fundamental needs, e.g. for safety, values and norms. These are the elements we call the spoken word. The spoken elements are big. What most organizations dwell more is on the visible elements. How we have deployed our vision, we have deployed our uh, mission statement, our policies are there. I have been to, I've had the opportunity of somebody saying, look, we thought that HSC, People were carrying an audit in some facility somewhere, and somebody said they don't have HSC policy. And the auditor said, please, gentlemen, can you read what is on the wall? He said, he thought it's a frame, it's a picture frame. So if you, you make your policies and put it on the wall, and it's not communicated, then that policy is not life, it's dead. So as practitioner, our HSC visible element and invisible element must be alive. Remember that invisible elements are more. The unspoken word are more. Today, the ability of every leader to understand the spoken word is very fundamental in the resolution of HSE issues. As leaders, we must 
lead by trust. Leadership is influence. It is only when our people trust us that when we say good money and they check their wristwatch, it is good money. This is some minutes after 11. And I check my wristwatch and it's truly a money. I trust my boss. But if my boss says good money, this is not a military balance. This is not a military environment. Uh, and I check my watch, it's after 11. And my boss is, is after 12 or after 3 telling me good money. There's something is wrong. So as leaders, we must lead with influence. We must get our workforce to believe in us. What we say, how we live, how we do, how we talk, how we move, people are watching. Our body movement speaks more than the actions and even the words we say. So HSE culture, leadership is very key. And again, like I said, I'll quickly just run through ISO 45,000 and what some of the key elements for you to understand what import this ISO has brought us in demonstrations and the building of HSE culture. In course of this discussion, I've spent some time to go through this um, section four context of organization. What is the organization all about? What are they doing? What scope are they going to cover? Um, we talk of number five, which is more of leadership and work participation. You can see that the emphasis on leadership and work participation is very key. And communication is the driving role, is the, is the onion, or so the highs on this cake, is the oil that lubricates whatever we are doing in the organization. So we are talking of planning, um, all the things to do under your planning in terms of uh, action to address risks and opportunities is very important under planning. And this is the moment, this is the time for organizations to see opportunity in district. And once you see opportunity in district and you pick those opportunities, I like it. Businesses grow on. And I must confess to you, a lot of organizations have seen the opportunity in this risk and they're moving on. Have we identified new risks? Have we identified new hazards? Yes, working at home now, we need to identify new hazards. There is what we call segmental uh, uh, strat, uh, uh, program. We have what we call integrators and segmentors. Integrators are these people who work at home. What they do is that they are very good in work life balance. You can see them even in this uh, picture. If you check some people, they have children around, they are families, people around, and they are called integrators. And 58% of us from the statistics are more of integrators. But there are segmentors, people who have their own offices, they lock the door in, they are in, they're after work, and they are the people suffering a lot from work-life balance. So part of the planning strategy is for us to identify the hazards associated with this new crisis we find ourselves. So if you are an integrator, Yes, we wish you the best, but all you need to do for us is to ensure that you create a demarcation between work and house life, because work must continue, bills must be paid at the end of the month. But if you are a segmentor, we ask you, yes, you are very good at your work, you are doing very well. We want you to start thinking on work-life balance, because work-life balance will also help you for higher productivity. So planning is an area that is very important to us, and other identification is very key. And that will also help us to determine all the legal requirements and other requirements that is needed to do this job. Now, when you go to seven, as I mentioned, to so support and operation, here we are talking about the resources that the organization will provide. The leadership will provide these resources. They are going to ensure that people are trained, people are aware, people get appropriate information. Uh, you know, we are used to what we call the act, the ASK. Is person aware? Or they have a, a, a proper attitude? Is this skillful? Is it knowledgeable? These are some of the resources that must be provided for us, and training will help us here to do a lot of what we needed to do here. And we need to create opportunities and updates for this. Then we talk about operation. Operation, my colleague, is very key. We are looking at one important thing here. How do you manage your contractors? How are you programming people working? All these things, even now they are working at home. You don't just say because you are putting a contract in place. Procurement will just deploy a contract to site. No, HSC element must be respected. The, COVID-19 protocol that has been deployed by the business continuity management unit must also come to play. And therefore, management of change is very important in this element. This is time for you to look at what could go wrong and ensure that all controls are put in place to manage them. And therefore, contractor element is very key. If you check the incident of OME40, I'm sure most of those people died are contractors. And therefore, the contractor interface is very key in the management system. My dear brothers, clause or section seven, operation, element of the ISO 45001 is very key. Above all, emergency response. Happy is that nation which in time of peace thinks of war. It is a very popular axiom which is written on the wall of Venice. When things are going well, when you are happy at your work, do you think that something could go wrong? Have you, even within the COVID period, test your HS management system against the drift you have set aside? 
And once this is done, then you are building a strong HSC culture. Gentlemen, we need to monitor. Whatever that is not monitored is not done. We have set people to work at home. Are we having a performance evaluation management system in place that manages, that monitor, that try to know what they're doing? Are we evaluated to know that our workforce has the resources to be able to work from home? These are the things the HSC department will be able to do. Then above all, are there internal audits? Who tells you that audit cannot be done remotely? If we are doing this remotely, audit can also be done remotely. Therefore, we will advocate that internal audit and external audit that can be done that has been planned by your organization should not be played with. Get them in place. Above all, we see in under operation, we are talking of management review, which is very key. Here we are looking at the adequacy of operations, the suitability of our workforce, and how effective this has helped us. So for a strong HSC management system to be in place, your management review has to be done to be able to test all the business continuity you have deployed, to be able to test all the policies, all the implementation, all the SOPs, the management of change that has come in, in line with your procurement strategy, how effective, adequate, suitable are they. And above all, we need to improve our system. I said in my, one of the earlier slides that the largest room for improvement in the world is the room of continuous improvement. And that will come from the lesson learned and shared from incident investigations. You have ability to identify non-conformity and put effective, suitable, adequate, corrective action in place. Continuous improvement, continuous to go back to do what you know best is doing and make sure that the objectives are achieved. And if then, we'll be happy people in this uh, at three system. We look at culture, which is what I've been talking to you in about. I have about more 15 minutes to go. So I'm going down now. I'm, I've put aircraft on the, we are descending. So everybody just put on your seatbelt and get ready to descend. We are going to land. Now, when you look at culture, I've spoken so much about culture. Culture drives us in accountability. Everyone is accountable for the safety and responsibility of the workforce. My boss will always said, be safe. Make sure your neighbors is safe. Your family will be safe. So it is not only you. We need to be accountable to the people entrusted to us. Adaptability, no autopilot here. I think about change. I will use this adaptability as part of my closing remarks so you get to know here more about it. Mind on tax, but thinking ahead. Yes, you are focused, you are aware of what is happening, but you need to think outside the box like the model my brain teaser have just given to you. You need to start thinking about it. I've mentioned about communication, safety leaves on conversation. We are a brother's keeper. Let us continue to communicate. We cannot put a policy together and not communicate that policy. You need to continue to ask people, carry a survey whether they understand it. My organization recently carried out what you call the great to work place survey. And the essence is to get feedback. Let the employees tell us how we're preparing. Are we doing better? These are HSC culture that must be imbibed. I always share this knowledge because in HSC, in oil and gas, there is no we are not, it's not, there is no market, it's only used for competitive advantage. And therefore, you can hear me speak and share my experience. Competency, are people properly trained? There is no excuse to say, hey, because we are shut down, we are in COVID-19 era, people cannot be trained. You are deceiving yourself. I have received more training in the last three months that I've done in most of my career period. Because you are either in this webinar, or in this uh, Zoom training, there, are lots, there is enough, more than enough information. Be ready to participate. Do not see this period as a period for you to lousy a way to build incompetency, to build, to destroy yourself. This is a period to build your career and competency. Discipline, training of the mind, we need to be disciplined with our time. We need to be disciplined how we, how we manage company time this time around that most of us are working from home. This is not the time for us to spend all our life watching television. It's the time for us to be productive. I mentioned about the segmentors and the integrator. We know our problem, those who are uh, integrators. Please, yes, to we'll spend time with the family. Remember, there is a demarcation. Let us be disciplined. And once you build that discipline, you build that trust, then your boss will know that he has. Then we need empowerment. We need to trust our people. I can change things here. Let's build confidence. We let us empower people to take decisions. If decisions are wrong, let us learn and know why it is wrong and quickly put corrective measures in place. Engagement. 
we need to engage ourselves. I like what we are doing here. Indeed, I'm a team member. Let's engage people. Do not just sit in your room and view policies, view procedures, and roll it out for people to implement. Engage them. Hear from them. And what, when there is ownership, once they take ownership, once they're engaged, you'll be shocked that the implementation will be flawless. Vigilance, don't trust good performance. Do not, do not trust good performance. Vigilance. Yes, yes, we are doing well. Do not think because we are doing well. Even the Bible was clear. It said, be careful because you are doing well, lest you should fall. So if things are going well with you, do not just sit on your house and say, ah, I'm done. No. Try to think because success is very difficult to manage. Let that be your watchword. Manage your success. I trust my supervisors. My supervisor trusts me. This is a system. Trust your supervisor. Let your supervisor trust you. It is only when there is doubt. Are you sure it's at work? Are you sure? Are you sure he has not gone to farm? Are you sure he has not gone to uh, Obalande market? Are you sure he has not gone to somewhere, my one market, or my three market in Port Aikos? Please view that trust. When you say to your system, you are on your system. Let your, share your time. Let him know when your boss know when you are off break. And I report everything. It is the right thing to do. Reporting is very key. If we have done everything and it's not reported, then no work is done according to ISO principles. We will always walk the talk, even under pressure. Let's continue to walk the talk. Let's continue to preach. Let's continue to learn and share from everybody, especially incidents. And above all, I am treated consistently fairly. Let there be justice. Peace is not the absence of war, but the presence of justice. Peace is not the absence of war, but the presence of justice. Let staff be treated justly. And if we do that, we have a, a strong HSE culture. Um, Going down, almost two more slides down. Continuous improvement, plan, do, check, act process. If you follow this process, always ask yourself, where did I start from? What am I doing? Have I reviewed my implementation strategy? Are they working for me? Otherwise, review. Then you continue to improve and you'll be shocked. The same strategy, when you get the slides, you read more about it. Um, I mentioned this for everyone to understand that HAC, and operations always competing. You can see what is happening. The CEO, you can see that HS is just one person. And I told you that most time HS is an orphan. CEO is just encouraging, try. We must tell them, tell, tell the operation people why this, we must not do this. Don't you understand that this is a pandemic period, we are losing asset, we are losing value, we are losing customers. We need to do this. And that's him I tell you, look at this gully. We need to make sure that even we are crossing this gully, we can cross it together. And the man is saying no. And the whole number of operation people are dragging safety, they want to drag into the gully. Remember, this is what you're going to see. There are competing priorities. But if you have leadership that understand the HSD, you are no longer an orphan. You are operating the model of Roman Catholic Church. We are a priest, has no wife, has no child, but he's called a father. So today, our pretty philosophy and model is that HSC become a father when we are able to think and speak the language of the business. HSC is no longer a policeman that arrests and prosecutes. HSC provides a model for oppression to thrive. And therefore, I urge every HSC practitioner here, if, if you are a policeman in your approach, please change it. Today, your job is to become an advocate to provide the enabling environment for the oppression people to oppress. And when they see you as a partner, when they see you as a shareholder, when they see you as a stakeholder, they will all have that confidence and trust in you. And that will be very, very, very important for us to work with. The summary of the joining is this. If we do all that is done, we will not get into a situation where our asset is put under pressure, our human element, we lost our human element, and reputation will be very, very bad for us. And therefore, conclusion, it is known that oppression and safety excellence go hand in hand. And in managing safety and also managing oppression together, you will do better. And therefore, employee mindset is very key in driving HSC culture in the organization. A good safety culture places the highest value on safety. 
occupational health environment. In that culture, people are always alert to expect the unexpected. People fully understand what they should do. People are open, they are open to suggestion. People believe their actions make difference to themselves and others. Then managers do not manage, but show genuine leadership. I want to end by sharing with you the thought of two eminent scholars, a businessman called Henry Ford. He said that coming together is a beginning, keeping together is a progress, and working together is success. And I end by sharing with you the thought of Charles Darwin when he said, and I quote him, it is not the most intelligent not the strongest of the organisms that survive, but those that are responsive to change. Change is here, embrace it, and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank, President you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Dr. Is it go go Mary? What a wonderful presentation! Well, Mary, oh yeah. We have just succeeded in having a one week lecture in two hours. Professional colleagues, you've been given the generic basis. It is now left for you to go into the specifics, train yourself, and grow on it. Please don't think that you have an MBA in safety today. He has just given you the foundation. A very wonderful foundation at, um, um, and way to grow. Please let us give open up for everybody to give him a round of applause or send him a chat saying thank you before he's up. So thank you, sir. Thank you. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Back to the business of the day. Thank you, dog. Thank you so much, dog. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You are awesome. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, oh, my children. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Awesome. You're wonderful, sir. Wow. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can, can we now um, go back to our mute mode? The mute mode. So let's get back to the business of the day. The, the doctor has given us generic, very summary of what doctor, first, I, I want to change the name, the topic. We, it cannot, we are changing it from promoting sustainable HSC culture in time of crisis. He has spoken not just because on oil and gas, but he has covered every facet of life. So that name, oil and gas, remove it, is a simple baseline presentation that suits everybody. The, the take home is this, just like we said, safety is a collective responsibility. Safety culture is our collective responsibility. The safety culture of our organization is the product of individual and group values, attitude, participation, competency, and, pat and patterns of behavior that determine the commitment to and the style and proficiency of an organization health and safety management. We've been given the foundation. It is now left for us to walk the talk. Just like I had mentioned last week, this is just a tip of the iceberg. ASP has several specialties. This is high level, so trying to showcase what, trying to showcase, trying to showcase what oil and gas is all about. By the time we break out into smaller units, maybe next month is next month may be a different thing, a different group, transportation and so on. We we can always interact and grow, and grow grow the profession. What he has said affects us as professionals as well. We, in ASP, we have something that is called just uh, your your due. Your due permission, I'm just digressing, just a two minutes digression. ASP has what we call professional code of professional conduct, which doctor has talked about. Stand for the truth, stand for integrity, be approachable, and also be able to approach others. 
So for ASP code of conduct, our code of conduct is an ethical benchmark for our members. These standards brings accountability, responsibility, and trust to whom the safety profession saves. We are supposed to save public, employees, employers, clients, and society and profession with fidelity, honesty, and impartiality. In all professional relationships, treat others with respect, civility, and without discrimination. Abstain from behavior that will unjustly cause harm to the reputation of the society, its members, and profession. Continually improve professional knowledge, skills, competencies, and awareness of relevant new development through trainings, education, networking, and work experiences. Consider qualifications before undertaking any professional activity and perform only those services that may be handled competently. Make informed decisions in the performance of professional duties that adhere to all relevant laws, regulation, and recognized standard of practice. Inform all appropriate parties when professional judgment indicates that there is an unacceptable level of risk of injury, illness, property damage, or environmental harm. Maintain the confidentiality of information acquired through professional practice that is designated or generally recognized as non-public confidential or privilege. Adequately represent professional qualifications, including edu ed education, credential, designation, affiliation, titles, and work um, experiences. Adequately represent that. Avoid situation that creates um, actual potential or perceived conflict between personal and professional interests. And if a potential conflict of interest arises, please disclose all ap ap applicable facts to potential affected parties. That is what doctor has just told us. Walk the talk in all sincerity, be open, be approachable, and let us take this as a collective responsibility. And you have seen it all. We are working from home. We can make best out of the COVID situation. If we do evaluations, adhere to our big uh, our work management processes. Please, I plead again. That's a high level summary of what he has said. This does not make me and you a subject matter expert. This is, has, he has condensed a one week or more work to two hours to give us footings for further training and further interaction and growing the network. So please, doctor, once again, thank you. We are going to give him a presentation. Uh, um, I'll call on the video president or her designate to present him a token from ASP Nigerian chapter before we take uh, open the floor for a few questions and comments and her closing remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, coordinator. We'll have um, our secretary present, present um, the certificate of appreciation to him. Mr. Monoba, please. OK. Uh, good morning once again, doctor. Uh, it's a very it's, uh, a singular privilege I have to present this certificate to you. You are really enriched and uh, refertilize our knowledge today. So on behalf of the ESCO, we we'll present this certificate of recognition to you, Dr. Sir Dr. Gogomari Oyet, for volunteering in ESSP Nigerian chapter as a speaker on promoting sustainable HSC culture in time of crisis in oil and gas. During the knowledge sharing series two of July 18, 2020. So as you can see under is signed by the president, Mercy Omo Ferrefo. So thank you very much. We appreciate thank you. Thank now we're going to email this to you formally no and then you. you'll help us print it out. You know, we are now fully digitalized. Thank you very Thank much. You. God bless you. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Please, if you have questions, uh, one or two questions for him, just raise your hands. Go to where you have participants, raise your hand, 
and this, the host will acknowledge you and will do it oddly. If you are not speaking, please mute so that we can hear these valuable questions and contributions. Thank you. Okay, please, let's please. start. Uh, I have uh, Anthony Premiese. So can you go on with your question, please? Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Well detailed presentation. Got everybody wild. Um, it's about safety anyway. It's about, like we know, they say safety is beyond paperwork. Safety is people at work. But how come the most prized asset an organization has is personnel, but management still go the extra mile to look down on personnel and place so much emphasis on production and their assets. We all will be hearing about safety going on, you know, the changes in the gear of safety from technology to this to culture, but management still go the extra mile to still put personnel down and put priority on production and assets. Okay, uh, is this something we can go ahead and uh, answer? Or we need to take all the questions. And no, answer? no, no, go ahead, Doc. Let me okay, take any Thank again. you. Uh, uh, you see, and that is why we talked about culture. Culture is simply a way of life. Organizations have built a culture where the human element is respected. Operation is a product of that. Because if you, that's what we always said, if you want to think that safety is expensive, try one accident. So when organizations build a strong culture, they now value their human element. When they value their human element, which is the human people doing the work, they also know that you see, like today we talk about artificial intelligence. And I mentioned to people that artificial intelligence, yes, is important, but it does not judgment. There are judgment initiatives that it does not take. The oppressions you have, whether you're automated, is human element that will drive those oppressions. So organizations have most recently come to realize that the human element is not only their most valued asset, but it's the most important asset. And these most important assets are not everyone. They are those that are intelligent. There are those that are safety conscious. There are those that are competent to do their job. So you can see a segregation. Everybody has been employed, but the most important asset to those organizations are those that are competent, those that are risk, those that have a high level of risk appreciation. So traditionally, when you follow the, uh, the culture model, you see the under pathological emphasis is on operation. But as you go to generative, you see that the organization will be the culture. We are the know that a safe environment will allow them to produce and achieve more. And therefore, they now place more emphasis and say, look, whatever you do, do it safely. Wait, we need to produce, but it must be done safely. Well, there is that understanding, a road conflict between oppression and safety. You see that that organization productively continues to grow higher and reduce incidents. I today has, I have the luck, and that comes from leadership. Because I have the luck of working with uh, a white man uh, who's stockman. This white man came and preached HSC so that every member of the executive council of OBH Energy today preaches HSC. So that even when you're in charge of operation, you know that HSC can, can no longer be in conflict with what you do. So it's a matter of culture. And today, as I speak to you, safety is part of my core value. When I use the word coffee, customer, focus, ownership, then the T, teamwork, the S there is safety, then integrity. So you see that. And in my mission statement, I told you that, we, I mentioned to you that building that is operating to the highest safety standard and delivering outstanding value to the shareholders. So you can see it's a culture of the organization. So the era when we think that oppression and safety are fighting, like I showed to you, is the culture of the organization. There are organizations where they are still fighting this tomorrow. The budget are cut. They don't give them enough budget to operate. They don't even employ more people there. They just, but today in my organization, I must confess to you, when I joined Rwanda in 2007, 2007, I, up to 2009, I had over 50 people working in my team. But today I don't have up to 10 people working in HSC. We have moved HSC to the line. So HSC is everybody's business now. You can see me managing external relations and communication and having oversight functions to HSC. I have an HSC, man HSC manager who is the leader, who is my boss now. It is only when it comes to external issues that you now compare. 
but I have an operation HSE manager who advises the operation team. So it's no longer HSC is somebody's business. It's everybody's business. It's in my scorecard. It's in everybody's scorecard. It's, as a salesman, if you meet your sales target and you don't meet your HSC target, you lose a bonus. As an organization, you don't have a bonus. So you can see that HSC is prime in everything you do. So that is the culture of the organization. So my brother, the, why we are having this discussion is for us to go in there and become evangelists that say, look, if you think that safety is not important, try one accident. Oh, thank you, Doc. Uh, I think, uh, Anthony, you, are you okay with that? Um, yeah, I would say partially I'm okay because, like, you know, why I say partially is like, you know, with this look, like he said something that he had a boss that was a white man. Before now, process safety and the rest, when you go for meetings, you see more of white people before the local content team. Now, the local content has come in, you go to the field with the surprise where a separator will have a problem, they will can cannibalize another separator to feed the other separator because they don't want to spend money, manage it, do it, you know, and when you raise too much questions, they call you name. Before you know it, they send you off the field. You know, it's still going on, likely, like you said, but it all depends on who is actually in charge of that system. When you have the wrong person in the system, these are things you continue to see. That's just it. Okay, thank you. So let's go ahead. Uh, let's take uh, our coordinator. You need to wait. Let's attend to others. We have uh, Nelson no, Ali. Before Nelson oh, comes in, please, I just want to plead that we are here to learn best practice and go back and implement it. Do not get yourself overwhelmed. Safety is a journey. Someday we'll be, we'll be, we'll be there. So the man that asked the question, if you don't mind, after the, this thing, give me a call and I'll speak with you on one on one. That's my contribution to you. Okay, thank you, sir. So let's take uh, Aliu Nelson. Okay, good morning, all, and um, thank you, Doc, for this uh, wonderful lecture. And my question is, uh, is more of a wonder. Most times we see a very robust. HSC system in the oil and gas industry. But when you look at other sectors, maybe construction, civil works, and other areas of the economy, you don't see safety being pushed to the uh, for, uh, front burner so, uh, so much. And my question is, how do we get all these other sectors of the economy, construction, maybe, for instance, road construction, to push safety in the put safety in the front burner of their activities. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Nelson. Uh, I think uh, if you ask me, it's a function of legislation and framework. Why I made I said legislation and framework. In the oil and gas, we have. It will put DPR rule, like the watchdog, up to, for you to do permit, there's certain level of, you, of a certain integrity you maintain. There are certain cultural level you, you exhibit. And again, the oil and gas, remember that this business of oil and gas offshore, yes, over the time, there are various standards in terms of what they operate and what they do outside. But the, for instance, I tell people that here may have a problem in terms of managing community, but in terms of HSC standards, in terms of the protocols they have in place, it's one of the best. The question you ask is, in that industry of construction, what is the framework? If you pull out oil and gas, in terms of the safety, because they know that they know that the industry where they are in, the risks in which they are under, they don't need to pray within the local law. They need to bring in Eastern law into it. But the construction industry, who is regulating it? The safety, for instance, I will have uh, uh, Eastbourne Institute of Safety Profession of Nigeria. What capacity are we built to now be able to now ensure that? This noble opportunity given to us as safety practitioners will pull 
the string and make sure that this industry are properly regulated. The construction industry has a lot of civil engineers. They belong to various uh, engineering professions. As all these professions be able to come together to say, look, this is the framework, this is the legislation. Now, if you ask again, go to various ministries, you have a lot of pockets of laws that are there, pockets of laws. How many of these laws are being aggregated into one basket and has a synergy to implement? So, going to end my contribution here is that the construction industry you are talking about the practitioner. If you see, even up to the best industry where you have Gilos Baker and the rest operating, is because of the standard those east, uh, uh, standard people are using that are helping. But in our own, we saw the video I showed, somebody is climbing up and two people are climbing the same ladder. So <laughs> we need framework. And that is the job me and you here can do through aggregating what the American Society of Safety Professionals are doing, the Nigerian Institute of Safety Professionals are doing. Can we aggregate together and put a pressure on the government to streamline the working? of occupational health and safety in Nigeria. So summary is that lack of framework is our issue. Thank you, Doc. Thank you very much. I think you've nailed it for, on that. Uh, let's uh, take uh, Chimbo Victor. Can you go ahead with your question, please? Good morning, sir. Um, Good morning. I am Chimbo Victor, and I want to appreciate the lecture we just received this morning and your presentation, very detailed. I want to say this is my first time being on this platform. I'm not yet a member of the American Society of Safety Professionals. I'm just a new um, graduate that just came out last year from Covenant University. I want to ask, because so far I've been making inquiry of courses that I could take in safety um, um, field to increase my professionality level. And I've noticed that the courses are very expensive and the no safety, um, no safety aspect is seen to be very expensive to grow your professionality level. So I want to ask, is there any way these courses could be could be subsidized for new people, considering there are younger people also that have this um, intent to proceed on the um, proportionality levels of safety. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, um, thank you, Victor. Uh, Victor, sorry, I just don't be afraid that I want to do some personal discussion. After this, you can call me, but I want to ask you a question. Are you using your laptop, you are using iPad, you are using phone? I'm using laptop, sir. Laptop. What's the cost of the laptop? Sorry, I just need to do some little mathematics. Okay, it's um, 120,000. We got it. Um, 120,000. Let's just stop that. Can you tell us, if, just worry, can you tell us the value of your phone, the phone you're using? What is the cost? Sorry, it's just a personal calculation. Okay, I'm using a phone of 20,000. Are you sure it's 20,000? Because those of you go for iPhone, no. <laughs> I got it. I got okay. Do you it know why I'm going that way? Do you know why I'm going that way? I no, remember sir. in I remember 2011. 2011. Yes. I met a young guy from PTI worry. See him. How did you pay for 350000 dollars to be in the neighbor's class? He said, oh, guys, it was my school fees. And I are you carrying me. Oh, guys, my school fees. I said, how will you pay? How can you pay the school fees back? He said, well, he has some, he will do all his day work and the rest thing. And, and do you know that um, that young man, yes, I made distinction in Nebosh. It was that young man that pushed me because every night he would call me, oh, God, hope you're awake. I, I said, yes. He said, don't sleep, oh. We need to pass this exam, oh. Two of us made distinction in that class because I now, he's a student. He knows how much he has paid, 350000 I think he will not wait. I was sponsored by a company. And I have to work with him, work with him uh, at a point, even with all my HSC knowledge. When I started the Bosch class for the first one week, I was afraid of myself. I said, how would people say the doctor come here and fail? What would the company say? 
So I push and work hard with him. Why am I giving this example? It's a student who was a student and was able to put every money he has and went into that study. Now, I also mentioned to you, yes, I work, but there are other competing needs for me that I can use money I earn to go and do. Somebody told me that okay, this money can, uh, can buy blocks. So, because I remember when I was going to uh, MIT, I know how much I paid to go to MIT. And the guy said, this money can buy blocks. So. And I said, no, this is what I wanted. So my summary to you is the expensive. Can you try and save money over time to do one like that? That is one, to save money. Then two, there are a lot of online courses that you do that are not pay, uh, you don't pay. Try and link, or maybe if we discuss, we can also discuss, tell you. There are a lot of online safety courses you can do at a certain level that you will build up, you build your career up. Then when you are now ready, you can now build the resources together to pay. So I will encourage you that what you can do now is the same way you save 120,000 Naira to buy a laptop, use the same me to save for any HSC course and continue to push because the day you are able to get job, then you now know that you have to do personal development program. And it's something that is just to my, I started over uh, six years ago to define what I want to be. And I must confess to you that every year I follow up strictly to it. Yes, I work hard opportunity, but if you don't have the opportunity, in renowned sense, whatever the mind of a man can believe, works towards it, he can achieve. A renowned sense, and I quote you, whatever the mind of a man can believe in, works towards it, he can achieve it. And I know since you have this mind, work towards it, you can achieve it. Thank you and God bless. Uh, thank you, Doctor. I think that is uh, Napoleon Hills. That, uh, I would said... like to throw more light, Mr. Secretary. Uh, okay, to him, ahead. to him and every other one uh, listening that will be in his shoes, I want to say safety costs across every discipline and safety is broad. You can't do everything. You just identify the side or the section you have passion for that you want to grow. Now we'll be having a career development for the emergence, uh, emerging professionals. Leverage on it, be a monkey in and listen to one of the things you need to do to be able to grow your career. The truth is that they are expensive because of the what it is. Doctor has said that you just need to be focused. Save over time and you will get it. Don't get discouraged. When you see some CVs and what people had acquired, Sometimes it's 10, 20, 20 something, 30 something years. The most important thing is you having a focus of where you're going to. Each year, identify what you want to. First, know where you're going to. Identify the things you need to grow. Have mentors who would mentor you through the process. And then gradually from one to another. Don't think about how you're going to get everything over time within a shortest period. It's expensive. But I tell you at the end, it is worth it. So liaise with Dr. and a few one of us and then watch out for our flyers for that career development for young professionals who this career development would help achieve the purpose to which you have asked. Thank you. Secretary. Secretary, over to you. So, Monoba, are you there? Yeah. I now hand over to the coordinator. Well, dear professional colleagues, we have finally um, landed, as Doctor had said. For those of you that are not not members of ASB, uh, it will be a pleasure to welcome you someday into the ASB family. There are several benefits right from specialties to group networking that you could annex from. Uh, I, I will encourage the secretary when, when, when giving out the presentations or links, you should include how you can become members because you have a lot to learn from. This is just the beginning of the best and the best is yet to come. The only way you can do it can get into these resources is just being 
either a student member or a full-fledged member, and we are open to over 40,000 people in 80, in 80 countries of the world and a wall-loaded electronic library and resources that cannot, that will not only grow your career, but ensure that you and your family are safe, especially in this uh, unconventional situation of our pandemic that we find ourselves. Stay safe and have a date with you again next weekend. Thank you. Thank you very much, Coordinator. Thank you, everyone, once Thank again you. for making our time to uh, join us. Hello, are you hearing me? Yes, yes ma'am, we are hearing yes, you. We can hear you. Okay, okay. Thank you once more. Special thanks to our presenter who had done exceedingly well today. Thank you very much, sir. We hope to have you again in our subsequent editions. Thank we, you, we have a lot of senior management staffs from different companies in the house today. I just can't mention them. The number of them, we want to say thank you. I'm seeing a lot of MDs, managers, seniors, executives, and professionals in different fields. I welcome you all specially, and we are glad to have you in our midst. Please beckon on us anytime to share your experience with us. We're really looking forward to it. To our guests from different bodies who are members or non-members that have joined us today, you're most welcome. Feel free to join us anytime we are having our program. And if you wish to share your experience with us, reach out to any of us, you're welcome. Visit our website at www.assp.org to read more about us and possibly join us like the coordinator have said, whenever it's convenient for you. To our leaders of tomorrow, which are our students, our emerging young professionals, we thank you for being part of today's section. Find time always to key into our sections, and we hope that it's going to help build your career. I have learned a lot today, and I know that you have done so as well. So hope to see you in our next session for next Saturday for another wonderful edition. Once again, a big thank you to everyone, and God bless you all. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you yes. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you, Doctor. Doctor. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so delighted for the information. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.